Another day, another story. An indigenous people's history of the United States for young people is an adaptation of the original book by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, aimed at younger readers. The book offers a comprehensive and critical history of the United States from the perspective of indigenous peoples. Welcome to Tabo Eminent Channel. While I can't provide the entire text of the book due to copyright restrictions, one can give you a summary of its content. The book begins by exploring the rich and diverse cultures of indigenous peoples in North America long before the arrival of European settlers. It discusses the complex social structures, advanced agricultural practices, and spiritual beliefs of indigenous nations, highlighting their deep connection to the land. The narrative then shifts to the arrival of European colonizers in North America and the devastating impact of colonization on indigenous communities. It describes how indigenous peoples were forcibly displaced from their ancestral lands, faced violence, and were subjected to diseases brought by Europeans, leading to significant population declines. The book also delves into the various treaties and agreements made between indigenous nations and the U.S. government, often resulting in broken promises and further dispossession of indigenous lands. It discusses the forced assimilation policies, such as the Indian boarding schools, which aim to eradicate indigenous cultures and languages. Throughout the book, there is a focus on resistance and resilience. It highlights the efforts of indigenous leaders, activists, and communities to preserve their cultures, reclaim their rights, and fight for justice. The narrative covers significant events such as the American Indian Movement, AIM, and the activism of indigenous leaders like Russell Means and Wilma Mankula. The book also addresses contemporary issues faced by indigenous peoples, including environmental challenges, economic disparities, and ongoing efforts to protect sacred sites and natural resources. In summary, An Indigenous People's History of the United States for Young People provides a critical and comprehensive overview of the history of indigenous peoples in the United States, emphasizing their rich cultures, historical injustices, and ongoing struggles for justice and recognition. Going beyond the story of America as a country, discovered by a few brave men in the New World, indigenous human rights advocate Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz reveals the roles that settler colonialism and policies of American Indian genocide played in forming our national identity. The original academic text is fully adapted by renowned curriculum experts Debbie Reese and Jean Mendoza, for middle grade and young adult readers to include discussion topics, archival images, original maps, recommendations for further reading, and other materials to encourage students, teachers, and general readers to think critically about their own place in history. Introduction, This Land. In the introduction, Dunbar Ortiz lays her task on the table. How might acknowledging the reality of US history work to transform society? That is the central question this book pursues. This book attempts to tell the story of the United States as a colonial settler state, one that, like colonialist European states, crushed and subjugated the original civilizations in the territories it now rules. Indigenous peoples, now in a colonial relationship with the United States, inhabited and thrived for millennia before they were displaced to fragmented reservations and economically decimated. Dunbar Ortiz asserts that the reality of the history of U.S. policies and actions toward native peoples is a reality of settler colonial imperialism, and that this reality is inherent in the national origin myth of the United States. Puritan settlers had a covenant with God to take the land, and the basis of the Columbus myth is in the discovery doctrine. She describes how the system of settler colonialism depends on force, violence, and genocide, and concludes that U.S. history cannot be understood without addressing that fact. In the introduction Dunbar Ortiz also discusses the changing approaches taken by historical scholars in dealing with these facts, and concludes they have failed to understand that history because they have failed to apply a colonial framework in their approaches. 1. Follow the corn. Dunbar Ortiz supports her assertion that North America in 1492 was not a virgin wilderness, but a network of indigenous nations. With her description of the agricultural and technological accomplishments, governance structures, trade networks, 
and practices of land stewardship of the indigenous nation's civilizations for centuries before the arrival of Europeans. 2. Culture of Conquest Dunbar Ortiz traces the development of the European culture of conquest and colonization during the centuries before the arrival of Europeans in the Americas. Key to her analysis of the Crusades, the papacy directing mercenaries to crush domestic pagans, women, witches, and heretics. The emergence of the concept of land as private property by enclosure of the commons and privatization of land. The use of displaced populations to settle the 13 colonies with the promise of land. The emergence of white supremacist ideology from the Crusades and the plantations of Ireland, and the use of that ideology to neutralize class conflict between the landed and landless by giving confiscated lands in the colonies to the landless. Other factors identified as contributing to the culture of conquest are the Protestant belief of being a chosen people founding a New Jerusalem, and the transition from religious wars to genocidal wars. In this chapter she also challenges history scholars' consensus terminal narrative. 3. Cult of the Covenant. Dunbar Ortiz discusses the myth that North America was a primitive wilderness when Europeans arrived. The role of covenant and exceptionalism ideologies in the British colonization of the Americas. Parallels between the plantations of Ireland and the European colonization of the Americas. The role of Scots-Irish colonists and their Calvinist covenant doctrines in the push of settler colonialism into the Ohio River Valley region. The transformation of sacred indigenous land into commodified real estate. 4. Bloody Footprints. Dunbar Ortiz describes how war was waged against native peoples in North America by settler militias during the colonial era, beginning with the wars waged by the colony of Virginia against the Power Tan during the 17th centuries. She includes descriptions of extreme violence inflicted on civilian communities, the use of mercenary military leaders who had fought in the European wars of religion, and the practice of bounties for scalps which had precedent during the plantations of Ireland. 5. Birth of a Nation. Dunbar Ortiz begins by ascribing the origin of the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms to the role of settler militia raids on indigenous communities and to slave patrols. She then describes events and leading figures in the confrontations between settler militias and indigenous inhabitants of the Ohio Valley and the Old Southwest. At the close of the chapter she states that war methods practiced during this period continued to be used in wars against native peoples west of the Mississippi, against civilians during the American Civil War, and in later U.S. military interventions in the Philippines, Cuba, Central America, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. 6. The Last of the Mohicans and Andrew Jackson's White Republic. Dunbar Ortiz chronicles the role of Andrew Jackson in waging wars of annihilation against native peoples east of the Mississippi, from 1801 when he commanded the Tennessee militia, through his years as U.S. President. The other major topic in this chapter is what Dunbar Ortiz describes as the reinvention of the birth of the United States in the novels of James Fenimore Cooper and other writers of that era. She also critiques how some historians have interpreted Jackson, bolstering her argument with a quote from Jackson biographer Michael Paul Rogan, historians, have failed to place Indians at the center of Jackson's life. They have interpreted the age of Jackson from every perspective, but Indian destruction, the one from which it actually developed historically. 7. Sea to Shining Sea. In describing the events leading up to and during the Mexican-American War, Dunbar Ortiz covers. Spanish treatment of indigenous peoples before Mexican independence. Early U.S. intrusions into the territory ceded after the war, including the expedition of Zebulon Pike that crossed into Spanish territory, 1806-1807. U.S. traders' arrival in Taos in the 1820s. Arrival of U.S. settlers in Texas in the 1820s. U.S. presence in California in the early 1840s. In this chapter Dunbar Ortiz also points out that the status of statehood in the territories of the Louisiana Purchase and the lands ceded by Mexico could be achieved only when settlers outnumber the indigenous population, which required decimation or forced removal of indigenous populations, and she contrasts the role of indigenous peoples in the American Revolutionary War, 1865-1865.
where they were targeted by the Continental Army as enemies, with their role in the Spanish-American Wars of Independence, where they were often participants in the fights for independence from Spain. 8. Indian Country Dunbar Ortiz surveys the genocidal wars west of the Mississippi River during and after the American Civil War, and federal policies negatively impacting native peoples during that time period, including acts of Congress taking away indigenous lands, including the 1862 Homestead Act and acts transferring land to the states and to private railroad companies, legislation halting formal treaty-making, destruction of the American buffalo, the role of mercantile and industrial capitalists, the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890, the policy of assimilation and allotment of collectively held lands. She also discusses the history of resistance, the Cheyenne in 1878, the Nez Perce in 1877, and the Apache in 1850 86, as well as resistance to allotments by the Cherokee, Muscogee Creeks, Hopi, Pueblo Indians. 9. U.S. Triumphalism and Peacetime Colonialism Dunbar Ortiz describes the parallels between U.S. military methods used against native peoples with those used overseas from 1798 to 1919, drawing on examples from campaigns in countries around the world, and asserting that these engagements were all about securing markets and natural resources, developing imperialist power to protect and extend corporate wealth. She also describes federal policy towards native peoples during the administrations of Franklin D. Roosevelt, Harry S. Truman, and Dwight D. Eisenhower, and closes the chapter with discussion of the impact on native resistance movements of the rise of civil rights movements and the global decolonization movements, and the response of the CIA to national liberation movements. 10. Ghost Dance Prophesy. A Nation is Coming. This chapter opens with comments on the policies of the Kennedy and Nixon administrations regarding native peoples, followed by discussion of resistance actions including struggles for the return of Paha Sapa, Black Hills, the occupation of Alcatraz, the founding of DQ University, the founding of the American Indian Movement and other organizations, the Wounded Knee Incident, Dunbar Ortiz closes the chapter with a recap of history of the Sioux from 1805 to 1973, and drawing parallels between Wounded Knee Massacre in 1890 and the Mai Lai Massacre in 1968. 11. The Doctrine of Discovery. Dunbar Ortiz describes the origins and application of the Doctrine of Discovery, from a papal bull issued in 1455, to the 1494 Treaty of Tordesillas dividing the world between Spain and Portugal, the later adoption of the doctrine by other European monarchies and then the French Republic, and its adoption in United States law by the claim by Thomas Jefferson, then United States Secretary of State, in 1792, that the doctrine was international law applicable to the United States, and recognition of the doctrine in the 1823 Supreme Court of the United States decision in Johnson v. McIntosh. Taking the long view of history, Dunbar Ortiz next traces the sequence starting with the formation of European nation-states by self-determination, through imperialism to secure resources and labor, to industrialization, to decolonization, and back to self-determination, this time in the decolonized territories, while noting the distinction between the indigenous concept of nation and sovereignty as distinguished from the Western European model. This chapter also discusses activities at the United Nations, such as creation of the International Indian Treaty Council, the 1977 Conference on Indians in the Americas, and the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It then describes how the United Nations study on treaties, completed in 1999, has been used to bolster indigenous claims for restoration, restitution, and repatriation of lands, such as in Cobell v. Salazar and the Black Hills lawsuit. Conclusion The Future of the United States The concluding chapter draws on imperial grunts by Robert Kaplan It is its discussion of the parallels between Indian wars and more recent U.S. foreign actions. That process rightfully starts by honoring the treaties the United States made with indigenous nations, by restoring all sacred sites, starting with the Black Hills and including most federally held parks and land and all stolen sacred items and body parts,
and by payment of sufficient reparations for the reconstruction and expansion of native nations. For the future to be realized, it will require extensive educational programs and the full support and active participation of the descendants of settlers, enslaved Africans, and colonized Mexicans, as well as immigrant populations. Thanks for watching.